We're looking at the tests of true and false prophets, and we gave you several. I'll cite those briefly. The test of divine compulsion, that's chapter 20 and verse 9. The test of divine compulsion, where, as Jeremiah shows, there is in the heart of a true minister a fire that cannot be quenched, he must speak. Then there was, secondly, the test of loyalty, chapters 21-22, that he delivers his message without regard to the consequences. Thirdly was a test of morality, chapter 23. A holy message is confirmed by a holy life. And then, fourthly, was the test of his message, we gave you chapters 23 and 26. A true minister's word is in harmony with the word of God. And we showed you how in all of those tests that so much of the ministry today fails just about 100%. And there's no point in restating why. That's all on tape available to you. Tonight, let's come to a fifth test. And that is the test of a divine commission. Tests of true and false prophets are ministers. The test of a divine commission. Now, this is Jeremiah 23 and verse 21. If you want to turn over there. And take with that Jeremiah's call in chapter 1 because he has the true call. And then God says here, negatively, I sent not these prophets, meaning those who opposed Jeremiah. Remember, they beat him and put him in stocks and so forth. The prophets and the priests, as well as all the people and government leaders were against him. He said, I sent not these prophets, yet they ran. I spake not unto them, yet they prophesied. Again, notice he calls them prophets who prophesied. But they prophesy lies and so forth. But if God raises up a prophet, he tells us here, he will both speak to him and send him with his message. Both his call and his message will be by revelation. It will be supernatural, in other words. Now, the prophets of God do not base their credentials on merely dreams or mental images or inward impressions True prophets or ministers do not have a message they picked up at the seminary or gleaned from someone's writings or someone else's sermons. So tonight, let's look first of all at the characteristics under this first heading, the test of divine commission, the characteristics of a truly called man of God, the fivefold ministry. And we see, first of all, that he will be given a direct commission by God. A direct commission by God. That's why we gave you Jeremiah chapter 1. We covered his call, that's on tape, with this statement by God in 2321, where God said, you know, I did not send them, they ran, I did not speak to them, and yet they spoke or prophesied. And so, first of all, the characteristic of a true commission is it will be direct. And I mean direct, like the apostle and prophet, where God directly will audibly and often visibly appear to them and call them, like in the case of Jeremiah 1. Read that again. Or Amos 1. Or Isaiah 6, where the Lord appeared to Isaiah and called him. Or Ezekiel 1. Or Paul on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. Now, if you've been around charismatic circles much, you know that there are those who sometimes call themselves prophets and apostles who do not have this credential of the divine commission, a direct commission. Let's stress that. Make no mistake about it, if a man's a prophet, the Lord has appeared to him. He doesn't imagine he's got a call. As I say, they don't base their credentials on daydreams or mental images or getting emotionally worked up in some revival service and believing God's calling them to be a prophet. I've met some who said they were prophets who weren't. I'm thinking one now who came all the way to Florida to get me to come to his church to preach. He said he received a call exactly identically like Jeremiah in chapter 1, 
And yet today he's totally rejected the Christian faith, has divorced his wife, has married a younger woman, and won't even let you mention God in his presence. By the way, that all started when he got ensnared in that deception of shepherdship bondage. Now he's nothing. The church is closed, and he is nothing. So not everyone who says he has the call has it. And then we're talking about characteristics of a true divine commission. God will give him original revelation to prophesy about. Now that's significant because the false prophets lack originality. This is chapter 23, verse 30. Notice, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. A false prophet copies those who have the true revelation. They copy the message. They steal their words, or part of them, that part that suits their purpose. Now, just to make a point, I have heard of people who are off in doctrine. In fact, I know of one cult that uses some of my literature, like the Deeper Life in the Spirit book. Someone once said to me, and I knew they were off in doctrine. One doctrine is they deny the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. That's one place they're off without going into further detail. And yet they use my book to suit their own purpose. They use that part of it that fits into their scheme of things. And so it's the same idea that they're stealing words in that sense. But the true messenger of God over in Numbers chapter 12, I'm supposing you're familiar with that without looking it up, Numbers 12 and verse 6, God said, If there's a prophet among you, I will speak to him in visions and dreams. And we see this also in Amos 1. Daniel, the book of Daniel, the book of Zechariah, the book of Ezekiel. In the New Testament, Agabus in Acts chapter 21, and so on. That God gives them direct and original revelation to speak. They don't have to steal anyone's words. Those whom God calls and sends will not be lacking in originality because the Holy Spirit isn't lacking in originality. and He's the one that gives the message. And there's no limit to the depth of his wisdom. He doesn't have to use worn-out expressions or repetitious, monotonous phrases or steal from somebody to have something to say. He gives original revelation. I think it's important that we say what this doesn't mean or imply when God said, I'm against the prophets that steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. What that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that a minister cannot learn from other ministers. He certainly can, and that's biblical. For example, just think for a moment, the Apostle Paul had those that trained under him and helped him, like Timothy and Silas and so forth. But in the Old Testament, since that's where we are, take Samuel and Elijah, for example. They conducted schools of prophets. They had sons of prophets and bands of prophets that followed them. This was not a school in the sense of a school of meditation following some guru where they seek revelation from the spirits, nor was it a school like a denominational seminary where they go to learn the art of pulpit oratory or how to run a religious organization. But if you'll read my book, Introduction to Old Testament Prophets, beginning with page 22, there I deal in detail with the sons of the prophets. There you will see the custom was that some prophets, outstanding prophets, would gather around them disciples, teach them the word, and they would assist in ministry. You can see this in passages I'll give you, but you can study it in the book. Second Kings 9, 1 Kings 9.1, 1 Samuel 10 speaks of the band of the prophets that followed him. And of course you have the examples as I've given in the New Testament, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and others. Jesus had the twelve, later the seventy. Moses in the Old Testament had the seventy elders that assisted him, and so on. So what God doesn't mean that we can't learn from others. We certainly can. We're expected to. Secondly, it does not mean that God will not occasionally reveal the same thing to different people. 
to more than one of his prophets or ministers. And sometimes it's practically word for word. That isn't copying. That's just what God wants to get across, the message in more than one area or through more than one person. I want you to turn, if you will, to see an example of this. There's more than one in the Bible. Isaiah 2. If you turn to Isaiah 2, and then turn over to Micah chapter 4, we're going to see identical prophecies. Let's read Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, first of all. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Now keep in mind the words. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. There's even a song about that verse. Now over to Micah. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. The words are almost identical. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. The law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It's almost word for word. Now, if you go to the seminary, they will try to figure out who copied from whom, who had the original prophecy and the other copied. Well, no, God can reveal the same thing to two different prophets. They're not identical. There's a little bit of change of wording, but it's so slight you'd have to have them side by side to see it. I don't remember whether the Hebrew, they're absolutely exact or not. But they're so close, you see that God revealed the same word. Now you've got the same thing over in Joel 3, 9 to 10, reversed. They're going to beat their pruning hooks into swords and plowshares into spears. See, it's reversed because Joel is going to take place before Micah and Isaiah. In other words, the battle of Armageddon, which is what Joel is talking about, but it's the same phrasing as far as plowshares and printing hooks and what's going to be made out of them in reverse. We won't read that. But there are three prophets that have essentially the same idea, although Joel will take place before the peace comes of Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. And then in the New Testament, you have very, very similar wording, but it's still talking about the same thing in 2 Peter 2, 4-6 with Jude, verses 6 and 7. Now, we won't turn there because we have too much to cover tonight. It's the same idea. Second Peter 2, 4 to 6, Jude 6 and 7. Speaks of the angels who left their first estate and are cast into outer darkness, reserved in chains of darkness until the time of punishment. And, of course, again, if you go to the seminary, they try to figure out whether Peter is the original or Jude, but God simply reveals the same thing to more than one. How many times have... Well, it's so obvious someone Sunday morning will preach on a subject and you'll come right behind them Sunday night and deal with the same subject from a different viewpoint because of the different personalities. But nevertheless, this is God's way. So it doesn't mean that we're copying one another, or these prophets did, or the apostles, it just means what I said, that God can reveal essentially the same thing, and sometimes word for word, same prophecy to different prophets or ministers. Thirdly, what it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that sometimes what another has said or written 
could not inspire another minister with an idea or a subject, and then he takes that and lets the Holy Spirit lead him in developing it and his own personality, that is, his own ministry, comes through. Now, of course, if he's quoting someone using an idea directly, then he should say so. As another has said, or as I was reading a book, I was impressed that thus and so could be true also, and so on. So there's nothing wrong with that. The reason is no man is an island all to himself, or a woman. Now, if you think you are, you've got a rude awakening coming. We're all products of others, our parents, our teachers, our friends. Authors, writers, ministers. And a minister, through his own independent study, sifting and study, prayer and preparation, will bring forth by his own distinctive personality, which the Spirit, by the way, has given him. Remember, God creates each of us. You've got an Amos who was a farmer, not a prophet, neither the son of a prophet. You've got an educated Ph.D., if they had them in those days, an Isaiah, who prophesied in king's courts. You've got a Peter, a fisherman. You've got the man of great wisdom and knowledge, the Apostle Paul. See, different personalities. And their writings are different. But the Holy Spirit inspires them all. And so, as I say... As Paul was a product of his predecessors and the apostles around him, I don't mean that he copied. That's not what we're saying. But he heard Jesus preach. He heard the apostles preach. And so all of that somehow gets put in the computer as the Holy Spirit inspires a person to speak or to write or whatever. Then their distinctive personality is drawing from all of those various sources because you see the personalities coming through in the writings. Well, that's a whole subject in itself, and so let's move on. But no man is an island unto himself. So God isn't saying that we just become a blank slate in the sense that you forget all of your character, personality, background, teaching, learning, or whatever, and it's thus saith the Lord, and that's all there is to it. No, he uses the background of people because he made the distinctive personality. Now, if that needs further explanation, I'm sure there are tapes somewhere on it for anyone who thinks they might need it, probably under Revelation and Inspiration and Biblical Theology, where we go into the detail about how God inspires and the way he uses personalities that he created. It's always inspired if it's in Scripture. That's not what we're saying. But he still uses the person that he made. You can hear it here. You hear different personalities coming through in the simple gift of prophecy. That's the way it should be. That's the way it is anyway. But these are two of the credentials of true ministers. First of all, they get a direct call and they get direct revelation. They don't have to copy. And God is saying here that some usurp this sacred office without God having sent them or without him having spoken to them. That's not only impious, but he says throughout the book, it's a lie. It's a lie to speak in the name of the Lord when you haven't heard his voice by inspiration or revelation. And so how much less, we can take a lesson from this, how much less should those without the simple gift of prophecy or the anointing at that particular time, that's 1 Corinthians 12, to stand up and utter some exhortation and add, Thus saith the Lord. Now, if you have something on your heart, if you have something that you believe the Lord wants you to deliver, then don't add, thus saith the Lord, unless you're anointed to prophesy. What you're doing is giving an exhortation, and it should be that. If you have a burden for the body, then exhort us, don't prophesy to us. Because each will be held accountable, just like these prophets in the book of Jeremiah, that add, thus saith the Lord, when he has not spoken and he didn't send you. You see, you can be moved to exhort us. You've been studying the word or whatever about some matter, but dear friend, you can't substitute enthusiasm for the anointing. You can't substitute a burden on your heart for a revelation from heaven. And yet, I know that I've heard it more than once, not only elsewhere, but in this church. 
Sometimes there's not even an anointing on a thus saith the Lord. I don't know if you can discern when there's an anointing or not. I believe I can. I know that I have. So unless God sends you and speaks to you with a word, silence is evidence of wisdom, even for a prophet. You want an example? Nathan. Second Samuel 7, you won't have to turn there because you ought to be familiar with that, where Nathan said to David to go build the temple of the Lord, and the Lord be with thee. The Lord that very night said to the prophet Nathan, now that was not a false prophecy or a false prophet. It was an error, and there's a difference. The Lord said to him, I didn't tell you to tell David he would build the temple because he won't. He's a man of blood, a man of war. Now, that shouldn't need any explanation by now. But he said his son Solomon, his son will build it. And so if God has not anointed you and sent you, silence is a mark of wisdom. Don't feel you have to speak because you feel some emotional or tickling or something. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed that I have that as to the office of prophet, as to the office of prophet, I don't find anybody seeking it in Old or New Testaments. I don't find any encouragement in Old or New Testaments to seek the office of prophet. Because if you have it, God himself will give it to you. Unlike the simple gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12, where we are exhorted at least three times to seek it diligently. So seek the gift. Praise God. So there's no contradiction to what we've been saying, that you should seek the gift, but don't use it. Don't use it unless you're anointed to use it, even if it's a simple gift. A third characteristic of a divine commission is that it will be authenticated with supernatural signs. Now remember, these are not the same tests as in the prophet's book where we have nine or ten, but these are based upon Jeremiah. You can put them all together and then you'll have how many, I don't know. This happens to be one we do deal with in the book. Sometimes you overlap in Jeremiah 20 to 29. Now, as in the other tests, as we pointed out, no single test is conclusive. Miracles alone are inconclusive because false prophets have and can and do to this hour work miracles. And there's Bible that says they do. So, if you don't mind, turn over to chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, and here is a test which you have to take two together. One is a true prophet will have supernatural signs to confirm his message, but so can false prophets, so you have to test a prophet's ministry not just with his miracles, but with his message. And here his message is out of line with the Word of God. Now, notice God calls him a prophet. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives a sign or a wonder. Now, look at this. And the sign or wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Then he goes on and tells them to put that prophet to death. He's a prophet. He's called a prophet by God. But God didn't send him. Now, he said he's proving us. That isn't just Old Testament, but new. He allows these things to happen. False ministers, teachers, and prophets to work signs and miracles and prophesy things to come to pass to prove us. Because multitudes, we've said it, time and again, stand in line to follow miracles. They don't care about the message, whether it lines up with the Word. Most of the time they wouldn't know if it did because they don't know the Word. That's why we teach the Word. So that if you see a miracle and then he says something doesn't line up with the Word, reject the miracle. That ought to be plain. So here is a false prophet who could perform signs, but he was tripped up with his message. He said, let's go worship other gods. Well, of course, essentially that's what they're doing. To take an example, JDS, 
They're worshiping another Jesus, not the one of the Bible. He's sinless, pure, holy, all the way through. Birth, life, death, resurrection, all the way through. And JDS teach that he became sinful and immoral and had to be born again. And some of them can work miracles and signs and prophesy things that come to pass. Multitudes are following the signs. And the message doesn't line up with the Word of God. And then in Exodus chapter 7 and 8, we see the magicians working the same signs as Moses up to a point. And the Bible says they work those miracles and signs. The non-charismatic church tries to explain that away. Well, it just appeared that they did. Because some spiritualists have been caught in fraud, they try to make a comparison, which overlooks the fact that occultists, psychics, and so forth can work signs, but because they're under pressure sometimes and things are not working out, sometimes they do fake things. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're still working signs, but they're plugs in below. They're working from another power. And then Jesus himself said in the latter days, they will do signs and miracles that are so unique and valid as far as it being a miracle or a sign that it could deceive the elect if it were possible. That's how close they are to the genuine. Matthew 24, 24. Mark 13, 22. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, Revelation 13, and so on. And so these things do happen. In fact, I know, I'm thinking of one now, a minister that multitudes followed. Four different sources have said he was false. Three of them told me personally that. The fourth one was cited to me that it was a spirit of divination, not a word of knowledge that he was working. And yet tremendous healings took place. And many of them photographed before and after, like cancers actually falling off into his hand from a face and that sort of thing. One told me personally that he saw in the spirit as he ministered a demon go out of him into a woman that he laid hands on. And other things that I've cited before under deliverance, so I won't go through that again, but there's a man who was working signs. Well, one said to me, I said I wouldn't go into detail, but I don't know if I've cited this. He said, I can pick up the phone right now. He's ministering in this city and call his motel and prove that he's false. And he said it cost me over $30,000 of supporting him to find out he was false. But he's over there in a the motel with a woman that's not his wife. And I can call the motel right now and prove it to you. Or we, you know, can go over and check it. Now, all true prophets will have signs, but not all who have signs are true prophets. And I'll tell you something else you might not have thought of. Not all prophets who had signs have them recorded. Why? Well, some were literary prophets like Jeremiah, like Joel. You don't have any... Supernatural signs. I'm not talking now about prophecies, but working miracles recorded. Some are literary prophets, writing prophets. Some are power prophets who didn't write. Many times you'll see them functioning in times of crisis. Like Elijah, Elisha, power prophets who worked many miracles and signs. God raised them up to combat Baalism, which was just about to swallow up the whole nation of Israel. In fact, Elijah thought he was the only one left that worshipped the true God. God said, no, I've reserved 7,000, but that's still, you see, a drop in the bucket. And so we don't have a book of Elijah. Let's turn to Elisha chapter 2, verse 9. You don't have a book like that. But the sacred historians, you see, recorded their, well, sometimes their prophecies, but their mighty acts and deeds, the history of them. In any true prophet's ministry, we've already said, that's the third point we're making under divine commission, he will have the signs and miracles. But if he's a literary prophet, there'll be very few recorded, because that wasn't God's purpose, to record all of that. You couldn't begin, John said, to record all the miracles of Jesus. You'd have to have a library. And so a prophet's ministry, you'll find both 
although not always recorded. For example, you have very, very little of what Elijah prophesied. He prophesied it wouldn't rain till he said so. Well, what else did he prophesy? See, you'd have to think. But you've got a lot of these works. Then, on the other hand, you've got 66 long chapters of Isaiah of what he prophesied. But I can think of only one sign or miracle in all the book. And that's chapter 38 when he worked the sign, predicted the sign that the sundial of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, would turn back 10 degrees as a sign to the king that he would live. Of course, there is the sign prophecy, sign-prophecy of the virgin birth 700 years later. But you see, there's very little sign gift ministry in some prophets, but more of the prophecy, depending on what God wants. But nevertheless, there will always be the supernatural sign. But don't follow signs unless the message lines up with it. A sixth test of authenticity of true prophets or ministers is the test of effectiveness. The message will produce results. The test of effectiveness, that's chapter 23, verses 28-29. You should already be in 23. 28-29. The test of effectiveness. God says, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell the dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. You see that requirement? Let him speak it faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? Or compared to the wheat, we could say, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Now here we have set forth the test of effectiveness. The figure in verse 28 of the chaff and the wheat indicates the contrast between the false and the true word. He said, what is the chaff compared to the wheat? See, wheat is nourishing. The word of the Lord is nourishing. It feeds the people. Because it's wheat, not chaff. Now there's so much, just like in Jeremiah's day, so much religious chaff today going under the name of the word of the Lord and the gospel, and yet people are languishing, they're starving, and they're dying, and they don't know why. Now those of us who've tasted the true bread, we know why. Because we can discern the difference immediately. That's right. When you're taught the wheat, the word you will immediately reject man's religious chaff, his doctrine, his opinions, his creeds, his interpretations. You'll spit it out. You have no taste for it. Just like whatever the worst food is or whatever you put in your mouth that had the worst taste back in the days of medicine even. (laughs) I'm thinking of one now that's supposed to cure everything from bunions to kidney stones. Oh, and it tasted like tar and... Shoe polish and carbolic acid mixed in blackstrap molasses. It was awful. So think of the worst thing you can think of that you ever tasted, and that's the way the chaff tastes us now. We just spit it out. Now, how do we discern? Well, God shows us how we discern here. He says, my word is like a fire. It'll set you on fire and it'll consume all of the dross in your life. He said, my word is like a hammer. It'll break that rocky ground in your life to pieces. Now, man's doctrine cannot do this in a life. It cannot make such a change in a life. Man's word will not do that. Your life will remain unchanged, just like it did in the old dead denominational system. If there's anybody here tonight that's from that system, we're just telling you like it is. Your life remains unchanged, and you'll be the first, if you're honest, to stand up and say, That's right! So what you need is the Holy Spirit and the true Word, because it'll burn out all of that old dead denominational opinion and doctrine and unbelief that has been saddled on you like a burden. And it will break up that rocky ground. If you're preaching God's Word, something's going to happen. It has to. 
Because God's Word is a fire. It's a hammer. It'll feed the hungry. It's sweet and it's not chaff. His Word will also, as he says, burn upon his enemies' heads. They'll either run from it or try to quench the fire, which is exactly what they do. And like a hammer, that word will beat upon their rock-hard hearts and eventually break them in judgment. Something has to happen. If you receive the word, it will bless you. If you reject it, it will break you. Now, people who pay their prophets to say what they want to hear, and many, many do, that's just characteristic of the church today. If the minister doesn't say what they want to hear, they fire him. And as a result... Many today cannot stand a blacksmith's ministry, the fire and the hammer. They want a fireman's ministry in their church, one who will put out the fire of God's word with man's word, and one who will substitute the hammer hammering on the heart for a pat on the back. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's quite current where he said they hire people who will come and tickle their ears. Let me give you some references in the Old Testament. People who call a pastor and pay him to speak soothing words and prophesy pleasant things. Well, you've already had it in Jeremiah where they cry peace and put band-aids on their wounds that will not heal them. But also in Ezekiel 13, verses 10, 15, and 16. Micah 3, Verses 5 and 8, where God deals with this directly. I was reading Ivan Spencer's biography that was written after he died. He was the founder of the Lean Bible Institute, and as a student, he tells about how he was on fire for the Lord and went into this denominational church and preached on divine healing. He said one of the deacons came after and said, Young man, you've got great zeal. But I would advise you to stay with the Methodist doctrine when you preach to us. That's the way it is, friends. First Baptist church that I pastored invited me to leave. Why? Am I not preaching the word? Oh, you preach the word. That's the problem. It's too strong. It was the blacksmith's hammer and fire ministry, you see. And they wanted a fireman to put the fire out. Seventh test, the test of consistency. We're talking about true and false ministers and how to tell. The test of consistency, he will remain true to his original commission. Now we have here Jeremiah 24, 1 to 10. And compare with that chapter 1 and verse 10. Because he's speaking about the same thing. Like in 24.6, notice the phrasing, if you remember what he said to Jeremiah in chapter 1 when he commissioned him. He said, I've set mine eyes upon them for good and will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. He's talking about the restoration, the restoration of Israel. And remember in chapter 1 where he said to Jeremiah, I'm calling you to a ministry of pulling down, destroying building and planting. Now, those are the two aspects to any true prophet's or true minister's commission. There will be these two aspects in his message because they're in his commission. The pulling down to destroy, the building up, the planting to restore. Unless, of course, out of fear or the desire to please, he compromises his message, but you find the same thing over in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, the same principle. The two-edged sword ministry, where Paul said there, the same word that ministers life to some, ministers death to others who reject it. The same word. There's always this two-edged aspect to any truly called minister. We just told you what it was. Now, notice in 28, verses 10 to 14, we'll have to turn over there, we're saying that this is the test of consistency. 28, 10 to 14. Now, here's the prophet Hananiah, 
who prophesied a two years captivity against Jeremiah, who said it will be 70. God had told Jeremiah to put a yoke of wood around his neck, signifying the yoke of Babylon that he was going to put on his people. It'd be under Babylon's yoke. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck, verse 10, and he break it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. And then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah the prophet, notice they're both called prophets, after he'd broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yoke of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. So what happens here, God replaces the yoke of wood from around the neck of his prophet for a yoke of iron. When Hananiah broke the yoke, saying, This typifies breaking the yoke of Babylon upon Judah in just two years. And Jeremiah had prophesied 70. Jeremiah went back to hear the word of the Lord again, and he said, Now put on a yoke of iron, and let's see him break that. He came back with the same message, but stronger. Now the point is, when the secular and religious worlds and the media threaten, ridicule, and slander a true ministry, a true minister, he will not only stay with the message that God gave him, he won't start watering down the faith message or the healing message, you know, run off and say, well, maybe it's a little strong. If I water it down, they'll leave me alone. He will not only stay with the true message, but the more they threaten, the stronger his message will become. Now, that's how you'll tell a true prophet. He'll exchange the yoke of wood for a yoke of iron, to use the figure here. The stronger the threats, the stronger the message. That's how you'll know if he's a true prophet. Now, you find that confirmed all through the Word. I'm not making it up. You see it right here in Jeremiah 28. You see it all through the Word. What about Amos 7, when they said, Don't prophesy up here. Go back to Judah and eat your bread. What did he say? Don't prophesy against Israel. Hear the Word of the Lord. And he gave them the message. 1 Kings 22. When everyone was trying to get Micaiah the prophet to prophesy good like all of the other prophets were doing to the wicked king Ahab, he said, prophesy good, hear the word of the Lord. He'll be killed when he goes against Ramoth Gilead. If he comes back at all, God hasn't sent me. Just get stronger. Jesus in John 6, when they murmured and rejected his teaching that salvation was through him, What did he do? He turned right around and came back with the teaching of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Election. He said, why murmur? You can't even come to me for salvation unless the Father who sent me draw you to me. He got stronger. Oh, when they rejected John 3.16, he came on with election. He said, only those who are drawn to me by the Father can be saved. Hello. Hello. That's what he said. You better go read John 6 if you don't know that. Acts 4, 17 to 22 is the threat to the apostles. Don't preach anymore in this name, the name of Jesus. What was their response? They spake the word of God more boldly out in public. You'll find out if you've been called by your reaction As I have said to people more than once, when the media and my enemies come against me, I just get stronger in faith. It encourages my faith in the Word of God because I turn back to the Word. And when I get back in the Word, I see it's there, just like I said it was there. I don't understand people that back off and talk about giving up the ministry when things get a little rough. And friends, it's happened here more than one occasion. That's sad. The only proof there's no call from the Lord. If you got the call, you'll exchange when they break the yoke of wood from around your neck to typify some prophecy. You'll put on the yoke of iron, just like Jeremiah. And you'll go out and preach as the apostles more boldly. They spake the word of God with boldness after they were threatened. That's all it takes is persecution to bring out the true and the false. The false will back off 
and trying to put fire out to please the listeners and to relieve themselves of any persecution, the true prophet will come on stronger. When I say prophet, I'm talking about fivefold ministry in general. Well, let's come to another test. The test of fulfillment. Fulfillment. We have here Jeremiah 25 and 28. If you return to Jeremiah 25, just keep your place there in 28 because we see the contrast. The test of fulfillment, Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. Here's Jeremiah's prophecy and his date setting about the length of the captivity. He said, This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. There shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished, then God says, I'll punish Babylon. And then over in chapter 28, Verses 1 to 4, And it came to pass that Hananiah spake in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. You notice, false prophets. Prophets who preach falsely will speak in the name of the Lord. Well, that's a test. It's not the only one. He said, Thus saith the Lord. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. He already puts it in the past before it's taken place. Within two full years will I bring again into this place the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. That is, say, part of the captivity has already taken place. It isn't the final work of Nebuchadnezzar. But he says he'll bring all of these back within two full years. And then the prophet Jeremiah, verse 5, said unto the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and the presence of the people that stood in the house of the Lord. Notice the temple still standing, so this isn't the final destruction yet. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. The Lord perform your words, Hananiah, which you've prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that's carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word, that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. That is, judgment against sin is what he's saying. So the prophet which prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. That's when Hananiah reaches up and breaks the yoke and says that they'll return in two years. And we've already read Jeremiah's prophecy in 25, 70 years. Now, obviously, both cannot be right. They both commit themselves to dates. So what's the test of fulfillment? Time will tell which one is right. To use a present-day analogy, the predictions of the institutional church, they don't know they're prophesying, but they are, promising a dead, worldly church that it will not go through the great tribulation, that there will be a great, gentle rapture of everyone who confesses John 3.16, regardless of his spiritual state or condition. Compare the prophecies you can hear at any church every Sunday like that with what the Word of God says. The parables of Jesus, the whole New Testament, Revelation 2 and 3, that it's overcomers who are going to be caught up. The dead church will go through tribulation and be purged in tribulation. The true saints will be purged. Most of them probably martyred because they don't take the mark of the beast. Now you just heard me say it. Time will tell whether they're right or whether this pulpit is right. Just wait. You don't have to follow either one of them if you don't want to. Just wait. You better follow the right one. I'm not saying that. (laughs) But for those people who are always on the fence, or if you just wouldn't mention denominations or dead religion, I'd feel so much more comfortable coming here. And so I'll just move it a step farther. Those, quote, 
prophets, unquote, who are charismatic, who are prophesying peace for this sinful nation, let it all say like Jeremiah come to pass. When it does, we'll know they're prophets. It isn't going to come to pass because of what Jeremiah plainly says here, and we've preached to you faithfully for years, that the prophets before me, Jeremiah said, preach judgment against sin. And this pulpit preaches judgment against sin. This is the most wicked nation that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And it's had the most light. Judgment will begin in this nation. Mark it down. Thus saith the Lord. And the more responsibility you have, the more stripes you'll be beaten with, America. No nation has had light like this nation. Time will tell. Just wait. Wait on those Western prophets who are prophesying peace. And they're called prophets. They're laying hands on one another, anointing one another with the gift. And if you're keeping up with what's going on, you know to some extent to whom and where we have reference. They're prophesying peace for this nation. There can be no peace, God said. All through Jeremiah, there can be no peace. And he said, I didn't send them to prophesy that. So time will tell. Now, time will tell doesn't mean that you have to wait to find out. It means that time will eventually prove whose word is true. But overcomers don't have to wait to know and have the assurance that what you're hearing tonight, and it's from the Word of God, is already true. You don't have to wait to see judgment on America to know it's true, or you've got no place in this church if you don't know that already. That's so basic, it's like a Sunday school lesson. And go home and study Jeremiah. And you'll see again and again and again, he said there can be no peace for Judah or Israel, and they were Sunday school compared to America and its sins. A nation of violence and sodomites and all sorts of revulsion in the sight of God. So overcomers who are walking by faith already have the assurance that what Jeremiah said and what this pulpit says about its relation to this nation is already true. So I said, time will tell. It doesn't mean that people who know the Word of God have to wait. The true saints in Jeremiah's day Believe him, not Hananiah. They didn't have to wait two years. They knew it would be 70 because his message followed the other prophets. And I challenge you to find the message of the prophets of this day, for the most part, following on any subject, divine healing, judgment against sin, the evidence of the baptism being new tongues. You just name your subject. Find them following their predecessors. They're not doing it. They're telling you now to go to the doctor. And yet they still run around laying hands on the sick, hoping, well, they might get something. And so when the secular and religious worlds, including the media, their mouthpiece, are ridiculing us and opposing us and saying we're wrong, time will tell. Time will vindicate our message. But dear friends, God's already vindicating it. How many has he healed? Just raise your hand. Look at that. That's the whole body. And yet we've had recent articles in the paper ridiculing healing. He's already vindicating you by giving you prosperity, getting you out of debt, saving your loved ones. But that isn't what I have reference to. We already know. We don't have to wait for time to tell that it's going to work and that God will vindicate us. But when I say God will vindicate his word eventually, I mean those who are opposing the truth now will have to bow the knee to Jesus. And they will have to confess that those of us who refused to compromise were right. And God will vindicate it by great signs and miracles and judgments and the manifestation of the matured sons of God. That's how he will do it. So that's all we're waiting on, just the manifestation. The vindication is as sure as his word. And he's already been vindicating. And these blind, willfully blind mediaites and denominationals and 
unbelieving world willfully close their eyes to vindication. I'm saying there's a time coming when they can close their eyes all they want. They're going to feel the judgment. They won't be able to deny it when they see you walking through the fire and on the water, raising the dead, emptying the mental institutions and the hospitals just by a word of the Lord from the least saint in the church. Well, the opponents of truth laugh at just the prediction that I just made. That's a prediction. They laugh at that. But dear friends, it's going to come just like God says, the test of fulfillment. Now, over in chapter 29, you can read that, and I trust you already have. Let me set forth how that in this chapter we see Jeremiah the prophet willing to lay his ministry on the line by submitting it to the test of fulfillment. Now, any true minister is willing to lay his ministry on the line to see what he says fulfilled, vindicated, come to pass. Four things he tells them in chapter 29. Settle down in Babylon. Build houses. Plant crops. Prepare yourself for a long stay. In spite of Hananiah, it's going to be 70 years. Secondly, he said, marry and increase. Have children so that you will not be diminished. So there will be some to go back in 70 years. Because most of you will die off over there in 70 years. So marry and increase. And thirdly, pray for your captors so you can live in peace while you're there. Now, that will preach New Testament non-resistance. What should our attitude be toward our enemies? There you've even got it in the Old Testament. Pray for them. Because if you interfere, you're interfering with God's judgment against this ungodly nation, and he'll have to judge you and remove you to get to those he wants to judge. So don't resist. If he sends the red Chinese or the red Russians over here, you don't have to resist. You're supposed to be walking in faith. Now, a lot of that dead churchianity out there is going to suffer terrible judgment. Blood will run in the streets. But if you've been doing your homework, you'll be invisible to them for all practical purposes. God will preserve. He will hide you in the hollow of his hand till the indignation be passed. But that's faith. That's why we labor in the Word to get faith in your heart. If you're trembling already over a little bit of mediaite garbage, where will you be in the flooding of the Jordan? Where will you be if you can't run with men? If that wearies you, God said to Jeremiah, how will you contend with the horses? Fourthly, he said, don't listen to those preachers who give false assurances of a short judgment. Don't listen to them. Now, when your message is in line with the Word of God, then you can, in faith, as Jeremiah does, predict its outcome. That's why I don't hesitate to say some of the things I've said from this pulpit, because my message lines up with the Word of God. So I can predict the outcome. It's not even original. It's God's Word. Like when I was told, before I was dismissed, for not celebrating religious holidays, since it's about that season, if you don't believe in Santa Claus, of course they didn't say that. It was ex-mass, pagan mass, as one brother says. But if you don't follow what we're following here, you'll run your ministry. We've seen men go off the deep end on some tangent and ruin your ministry. That was their prophecy. My prophecy was, I'll ruin my ministry if I do what you're doing, compromise. And I would have. But over the years since 1963, when I refused to bow down to the Christmas tree, God has vindicated this ministry again and again and again. From 15 or 20 rolling around in a little cottage and went on a lake, look how many of you are here. And I didn't invite a one of you, except through the Word. Where did you come from? God vindicated the word that I preached. And I still say, 
Xmas is out of paganism into Romanism into Protestantism. You can read it yourself in the encyclopedias. I'm still with the same message. Though I don't make a big thing about it, I usually forget it. I say don't make a big thing about it. I don't have a Christmas sermon against it. I just figure anyone who's intelligent and comes to faith assembly notices we don't celebrate religious holidays. We don't have to make a big to-do out of it. We don't celebrate secular holidays. No firecrackers. Celebrating revolutions. One faith attender, until he got too hot in the kitchen, said to me before it got too hot, and he left, he said, if you would just lay off the denominations and teach, you know, that God heals through the doctors as well as through prayer, he said, you would gain a large following. I said to him, gain a large following. If we had any more coming, I wouldn't know where to put them. We're enlarging the end out there so some of you with babies will have seats. But I'll tell you one thing, and I said this to him, I can only please one group of people, either people like you who want to compromise, who don't want the strong word, or those saints like, for the most part at least, who are coming, who are willing to pay the cost and are paying the cost. I can't please both groups. And so if I please the kind of people you want, you say a large following, I'll lose the saints. The rest of you, they wouldn't put up with it. They've got more sense. You. Well, all I'm saying is a true prophet will lay his ministry on the line willingly by faith, knowing his predictions will come to pass. And there are a lot of predictions that come over this pulpit, friends, if you're keeping up. But they line up with the Word. They line up with the Word. Father, in Jesus' name, let every heart be open to the time that we're living, the end of the age, just as you've shown us through this study in Jeremiah that we're living in an end time as he lived in an end time, when he saw his nation, just as he predicted, go into captivity. Help the people to see that we're living in the same time when this nation will suffer the same judgment, yea, even worse because of the light it's been given, and that each will prepare his or her heart to be able to stand according to Ephesians 6, be able to stand against Satan, and having done all to stand. Father, it's my prayer that each of us will not shirk his responsibility to put on the whole armor of God And take up that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the shield of faith, both of which you have again and again revealed to this church is necessary to endure to the end. And having done all with the shield and the sword, we will be able to stand what is yet to come. May no one, Father, treat it lightly, but by your Spirit know that it is a solemn, serious time to get our houses in order, get our faith conditioned to where it should be, have the sword not just in our hand, but our heart, the Word of God is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I trust you'll not treat Jeremiah's studies lightly, but that you'll go back through and listen to those tapes. Get it down in your heart, because it's as contemporary as when Jeremiah spoke it. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us, please?
is our prayer and we dismiss ourselves with this as our confession it's our desire and will to know and do your will and to obey you that in that day that is so soon that you will not be ashamed to say that you are our God and we are your people Bless us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.